thank you for being in this place. I'm going to ask you just to remain standing as the family is seated. Here at the front, Mark Trammell's coming to pray for us, and then we'll turn our eyes toward the screens for an opening video tribute. Mark, thank you for being here, my friend. Pastor. Let's pray. Father, the joy in our hearts today, being privileged to gather in this way to celebrate the life of a soldier, a hero, a mentor, a friend. And we give you thanks for the smile in our hearts and the treasure that is ours in knowing your child, Les Beasley. Allow us these moments to reflect on the richness in knowing him in this life and to look forward to eternity with you, with him, and all of the saints who have gone before. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You'll never mother virgin raised in a carpenter shop his people were slaves his parents were poor his friends a lowly lot his chances in life are very slim he's expected to be a slave but people in darkness saw light in him and hope of freedom he gave. Go tell on the mountain over the hills and everywhere. Go tell on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Was in a lowly manger that Jesus Christ was born. The Lord sent down a band of holy angels that bright and glorious. Go and tell it on the mountain, Go on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain, that you. I talked about the Lord. I about the Lord. He's a God to hold. He's a God to hold. He's a God to hide. He's a God to hide. was laid when he stretched out the milky white way set the sun blazing in the sky place the moon and the stars on high king of glory king of glory king of king 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 I'm gonna meet my savior when my race on earth is o'er. Sit down, sit down, sit down, servant. I'm gonna hear him say, Sit down, sit down, sit down, servant. Welcome home to stay. When I shake my savior's hand, walk all around God's promised land. Sit down, servant, rest a while. I'm gonna hear him say, The Flower Boy is our special guest. Sing it, darling, sing it. Disappointments, strife and discontentment I cast my every care upon the Lord No matter what obsession, pain or deep depression I'm standing on the solid rock I'm standing on the rock of ages Stolen all the storms Standing 
host of the evening uh, no matter uh, he's the and greatest moving right along <laughs> he's the greatest at what he does a, a real crowd pleaser but it doesn't matter sometimes a crowd can get the best of you and it did get the best of him one night in Long Beach uh, uh, I know that James was there the Blackwood statesman and the Florida boys and uh, Jerry and his group and Jerry's having a, a terrible time and it wasn't his fault because the sound was really atrocious that night. The people kept saying, turn it up, turn it down. Turn it up, turn it down. Turn it up, turn it down. Finally, Jerry said, you say turn it up, turn it down. I'm going home. And he started to walk out. <laughs> and a lady in the audience said, good night. <laughs> Now let me tell one on myself. In the same same auditorium, we followed the Blackwoods and Statesman. That wasn't a good thing to do in the city. <laughs> and when we finished, I did them a record plug and I said, now nah, don't go home at intermission because we always do better after intermission. And the lady, it may have been the same one, I don't know, she said, Well, I certainly hope so. <laughs> Let's have a great welcome for the Florida Boys, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to start out with the old group that we traveled many, many years ago. <laughs> Well, if we're going to go way back, we got to go way back. I was going <laughs> That's pitiful looking, ain't it? Here's a song that we, this group recorded all oh, 35 or 40 years ago, and uh, Brother uh, Waller said he thought we ought to do it, so Tommy said he thought he could do the fiddling. It's been a while since he fiddled, but I guess he can. <laughs> for their farewell appearance at the National Quartet Convention, the legendary Florida Boys.
Bye, thank you. Thank you so much. We appreciate that. You can't help get a little sentimental when you look at people who have made such beautiful art and made such a wonderful contribution in, our, in all of our lives yes. and to think that they're not here anymore. And thank God for an Albert Brumley who came along and said, there is another day, another time, when all God's singers are going to be there. First of all, we want to thank you all for being here. Just looking at your faces out, out there, I, I see so many who have made an extra effort to be here today. You've gone through expense, you've gone through a lot of trouble, you've traveled a distance to be here, and we just want you to know how much we appreciate that, how much we appreciate your friendship and your willingness to show Dad how much you loved him and show us how much you loved him. And, and I want to publicly thank the pastor, Dr. Trailer, for being willing to officiate today. He's actually on his sabbatical, but when he heard the news, he volunteered to be here today to officiate. And I just want him to know we would have never asked or expected him to do that but the fact that he was willing to do that means more to us than, than he probably knows. And so we just want to thank you all for being here for this celebration of life. And that's very much what we want it to be today. We want this to be a celebration of this remarkable life. This life that was long-lived and this life that was well lived. And what's the measure of that, do you think? What's the, what's the measure of a life well lived? Well, I think the measure of a life well lived is how much a life counted for the gospel and how much a life counted for others. And boy, does he ever get high marks in both regard. First of all, for making a life counting for the gospel, he spent his entire adult life going around and spreading the gospel of Christ by means of a gospel song all over this country, many parts of the world, over 200 days a year until he was 79 years old, making all those miles with his two great partners, Glenn Allred and Daryl Stewart. Glenn and Daryl, we love you so much. You're family to us, and thank you for being here. But his life counted for the gospel, and, and not just live appearances. I mean, he, he, he produced a TV show that was seen by millions every Sunday morning, coast to coast, border to border. And on every one of those episodes, the gospel was proclaimed. So his life counted for the gospel. And then secondly, his life counted for others. Uh, I tell you, it's, it was, it's been so gratifying for us to hear the testimonials of all of you who have come by. And then throughout this past week, uh, as news of it spread, we've, we've had countless cards, letters, emails, messages, social media posts. And I really appreciate what the Singing News has done in, in posting the testimonials of various people in gospel music, saying what Dad meant to them. You know, I, I really appreciate that. But... It was, it's just been testimonial after testimonial of not just we loved less, we highly appreciated less. Now, it, it's been, I mean, just one story after another of because God chose to see fit to make my life's path intersect with Les Beasley's, my path was forever changed. I, I did things that I wouldn't have been able to do were it not for him. And it's just been story after story like that. His life counted for the gospel. His life counted for others. This is, a, this is a life of significance. This is a life that mattered. And we want to celebrate that today. 
Not, not that there's not a measure of grief, because there is. There's a, there's a measure of sorrow. Not that we're not going to miss him. Oh, my. That infectious laugh and effervescent personality that would just light up a room whenever you... How, how can you not miss that? We, we loved him too much not to miss him. We're, we're never going to get over missing him. We're always going to miss him. So there is a measure of sorrow today. But on that little card you got when you came in, there's a promise written in there that's found in 1 Thessalonians 4. And it says, for those of us who are in Christ, we don't have to sorrow as those who have no hope. And the family has decided that since we don't have to sorrow that way, we're not going to. We're not going to sorrow that way. Actually, mom kind of set the tone for the day when she told all of her children that she was not going to wear all black today. No. <laughs> And it wasn't up for debate or discussion. She was not going to wear all black. And, and I think that's, that's symbolic that we don't have to sorrow as those who have no hope. You see, for, for those of us who are in Christ, we are fully vested shareholders in all the promises of Scripture that bring us tremendous hope. And it is on those immutable promises, those unchanging promises that we're going to anchor to today and that's going to give us hope today. You see, those promises give us the hope that though we lay them to rest today, there's going to be a great getting up morning. Though we say goodbye today, those promises give us the hope that there's going to be a glad reunion day when we're going to stand and sing around the throne eternal. And it is with the hope of that one splendid day, it is with a view toward that day that we're going to conduct the service here today, if that's all right. And to get us started Someone who dad loved. I tell you, dad loved Dale Shellnut. And Randy and Scoot, he loved like family. Dad, dad loved Randy so much that he, uh, he did business and recreation with Randy. That's an elite group of people. Not, not many have that designation. But dad, dad loved Randy. The Dixie Echoes have been so gracious to be willing to perform today. And this first song that they're going to do some of you might not consider it to be funeral appropriate. But i tell you why they're going to do it. Uh, when, I, when I came home a couple weeks ago, Dad and I were sitting in the living room, and we were watching the Dixie Echoes Monday night performance from the quartet convention. And uh, they have just recorded a new arrangement of an old statesman classic, Getaway Jordan. And it kind of had a Swanee River Boys feel to it. And Dad loved the Swanee River Boys, had, had a world of respect to Buford Abner and those guys. And when he heard this, he just couldn't get enough of it. He thought this was great. And, and if you listen to the words, and, and thanks to Randy's arrangement, you can actually listen to the words and understand the words. Maybe for the first time in this song's history. <laughs> You listen to these words, it's actually the perfect funeral song for, for someone who died in Christ. This is the perfect funeral song. So they're going to sing that, and, um, and they're going to conclude with their spectacular arrangement, a cappella arrangement of In the Garden. I tell you, Dad thought male quartet harmony and four-part harmony was music at its highest level of refinement. And you're going to hear a great example of that. And Randy, whatever you want to say, you help yourself, brother. 
We so appreciate you being here today. Make welcome, would you, the Dixie Echoes. Across my breast. I don't have to worry about the way I'll fare. God Almighty done told me he'd be right there to lift me up on the wings of love, to carry my soul to heaven above, saying, Get away. Get away, old Jimmy Joe. Get away. Get away, old Jimmy Joe. Get away back. And I'll get back to Jordan. I want to go so bad to see my Lord. Get away. Get away, old Jimmy Joe. Get away. Get away, old Jimmy Joe. Get away back. Get back, Jordan. I want to go so bad to see my Lord. I said, Get back. Get back, Jordan. Get away back. Get back, old Jimmy Joe. Oh, get back. Get back, Jordan. No, I want to go so bad to see my Lord. I said, Get back. Get back, Jordan. Get away back. Get back, old Jimmy Joe. Get back. Get back, Jordan. Oh, I want to go so to see my Lord. Well, get away. Get away. Clark, my hat is just off to you. You know, uh, you're so eloquent, and uh, you say the right things, and, and I know where that comes from. I do. I know that our buddy, my buddy, and my friend and, and loved one was uh, the influence on that. <clears throat> I can't hardly say a whole lot because I just can't, pull myself together too well in occasions like this. But you know, I got to thinking last night, I was laying down <clears throat> and I said, I really believe that God puts people in your life to influence you. God works in mysterious ways. And uh, <laughs> boy, did he put people in my life. You know, if I wasn't a gospel singer, I don't know what I could be. Uh, can't do a whole lot else. <laughs> but uh, people like my dad, Dale Shulnut, Les Beasley, J.G. Whitfield, Glenn Allred, Daryl Stewart, and uh, Hal Kennedy, so many of them <clears throat> that God just put in my life, and, and not, not just acquaintances, but loved ones and friends. <clears throat> You know, I really feel like if I'd, have, if I'd have done something else after God was throwing all of these wonderful people in my life that when I got to heaven, God would say, seriously, really? I tried to. <laughs> but I, I'm thankful, and I know I've talked to Les many times about this. Well, you, you feel like you need to quit, Les? You feel like we ought to just stop? I'm afraid to quit. 
That's, and I would have said it like less, but I don't know if that would be appropriate or not. We, <laughs> we talk like him a lot. <laughs> you know, Randy. <laughs> One of my dearest friends, Roger Bennett, <clears throat> and I met who I miss terribly also. He and I love to talk like Les. We, we spent one quartet convention, we spent the evening and the night together, we just went to eat and he, were, he and I were just very good buddies. But we talked like Les the whole day. <clears throat> Roger, did you enjoy that hamburger? <clears throat> well, Randy, and we talked like that all day long, Clark. We, and that night, one, <laughs> you'd probably understand this as good as anyone. We were laying there in the beds, and we, uh, we were in a motel room, and, and uh, I was over on this bed, and Roger was over there, and it, it had to be 1 o'clock in the morning. We're still talking like less. <laughs> and we finally, you know, it got to the point where it was going to be quiet, <clears throat> and we were fixing to go to sleep, and, there was about a two-minute silence there, and I heard, a, <laughs> I heard a voice coming from over on the other bed. It says, Randy, I can't stop talking like this. <laughs> well, which spurred on another 30 minutes of talking like Les. I loved Les, and I know that he loved me, and I've... If there's any, there's things in my life that I don't miss. I don't miss working on buses. But I, I will cherish every moment we spend underneath the bus together. And uh, one of those greasy pictures up there, I feel like I was probably the blame for him getting that greasy. You know? yeah. But we want to uh, do an old hymn. And we're going to try to do the truth. Let's just gather around the one microphone on this one. The old true four-part harmony. And I really feel like Les would enjoy this, and I hope so, and I hope that we can do it all the justice. I come to the garden. I'll never forget your name because the first man that I buried in November of 1969 name was George Henry Trailer. Uh, first person ever buried and back then of course I grew up very poor and you can understand that because I'm the baby of 15 kids 
We farmed. Uh, Dad never owned a trailer, tractor, all those 32 Ford B model pickup, and we did it with mules and horses and plow stocks and wagons. And so you can understand how I grew up. But let me say in the beginning uh, to the family, uh, Francis, to you and uh, uh, your entire family, uh, all of you that uh, you, uh, I'm so honored uh, that you have asked me uh, to come and speak uh, today. Not a, uh, I've buried lots of people. Uh, this is the third funeral I've had. Les always was amazed at the funerals that I did. Uh, I, uh, this is the third funeral I've had in the last 10 days and I have two more waiting on me when I get back home. Uh, but it's always an honor, Clark, to speak. Uh, at anyone's funeral, I buried them all the way from paupers uh, to some of the wealthiest people I have ever known, some of the greatest doctors in uh, Clay County that we had in Ashland, Alabama, uh, Dr. Bill and Dr. Horn, they were great doctors. <clears throat> and uh, also, uh, I, the other day I visited a friend of mine uh, former governor, John Patterson, just a few weeks ago, he turned 97 years old. And when I left, he, start, he told me, says, Zenus, remember, you're going to have to do my funeral. I says, John, if you want me to do your funeral, you better hurry up and do something. I'm getting old myself. Uh, but, uh, but anyhow, I've had a lot of great experiences in life. I wear a lot of hats. I'm an author. I'm, first of all, Baptist preacher, child of God. I uh, repented many years ago. And I want to tell you this, what I told my church last Sunday. I said, if you want to go home today, and we, Mark and I go out and get in our car, I said, before we can go anywhere, we've got to crank that car. I said, before you go to heaven, you're going to have to repent if you had not already done it. I fell in an old-fashioned altar and the old preacher prayed for his, me uh, to God and he forgave me of my sins. And I appreciate that today. And so I trust that you have repented and as Les did many years ago. Uh, uh, the Bible said that God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Les did that many years ago. And he and I have talked about it many times, and I have a, a lot of stories to tell you about Les, but uh, in the Ecclesiastes, the seventh chapter, he says, a good name is better than precious ointments. And the day, listen to this, the day of death, the day of death, better than the day of one's birth. Think of that. Uh, and I want to tell you, uh, Francis, you and uh, your family entirely, all of you, uh, that uh, Les is not dead. He just moved on up to a better place. And I'll assure you that he's living on. And one day after a while, uh, Francis, you'll see him again, you and Clark, all of you, when you get up there. And I know, Francis, that you'd love to be his wife but that won't be. There's no marriages in heaven. And we were in Jack's one day, a drinking cough where Les and I'd go many times. And we're sitting there with an elderly gentleman who's 10 years older than me, still in the nursing home. I went to see him the other day down there in Lionville. Uh, old brother Camp, Hugh Camp, 93 years old, 10 years older than me. And uh, he was wanting, he was asking me, we was talking about his wife had passed away a few years before, and he said, uh, Preacher, will, will, will she be my wife in heaven? I said, no, uh, that, that won't be. You'll know her, but you won't, uh, you won't be, as, be her husband. And he said, well, why? And I'll never forget this. There's a boy there uh, that I buried a few years ago from down in Waddle, Alabama, and he says, Brother Camp, he said, listen to me. The reason that you cannot be married to her in heaven, that's a place of perfect peace.
You know, if, uh, I'm a person that loves to treat everybody the same. I, I don't really care who you are, whether you're rich, poor, uh, what uh, you are, big, little, whatever. Uh, and I was drinking coffee one day uh, up in Lionville with a black man, good friend, a great preacher, Brother Reverend Caldwell, passed away a few years ago. Well, we were sitting there drinking coffee, and he said, Preacher, I want to tell you about my congregation. He says, they want to be big shots. And I said, Preacher, they pose Job Turkey, and he had to lean up against the fence to gobble. He said, I told them this, and you're going to love this, folks. He said, I told them, said, be what you is. Don't be what you ain't, because if you ain't what you is, you is what you ain't. And so today, I, want, I said that to tell you this. I am what you see today. Uh, like I said, I wear a lot of hats. I'm a farmer, preacher, and uh, auctioneer. I do a lot of things. But uh, let me tell you one thing. I want to be what I am. And I want, to tell, I want you to know exactly, every one of you, how I feel about when I look down and see this flag upon this casket. I bear a lot of veterans. I buried the first veteran that was killed in Clay County in the Vietnam War, Eugene Cottonhead up in Shallow Baptist Church in Lima. But I want you to know today the person that will not stand for the national anthem, I have zero for that person. I don't care who they are. People that gave their life, many of them paid the ultimate sacrifice. I bear them that had lost an arm, a leg or something, uh, and I had a brother that did not lose his life, but he lost his mind. He told me, he said, Zenith, you'll never know what it is, bombs falling all around you. You never know when one's going to blow you into another world. He came home, he never was worth anything. He uh, died at age 44, young man. October the 26th, this a uh, few weeks ago, I buried a cousin of mine, Darrell Carson. The same situation. Uh, went to war, the Vietnam War, came home, never worth anything. Died with his mind completely gone. So let me say this. I have all appreciation in both of my churches uh, that uh, in Veterans Day, we recognize the veterans in our church and we had a moment of silence for those people uh, that paid the ultimate sacrifice and for those that served as Brother Les did. So uh, I'm going to move along, and I won't, I won't scare you real good. I come from a long line of primitive Baptists. Now, that'll scare you if you know anything about a primitive Baptist. Because when they got up, they didn't know when to quit. Old Baptist preacher, old primitive Baptist preacher got up one morning at 11 o'clock and at 4.30 that afternoon, he is still hammering away. And the old farmer got up, started walking out of the back of the church. He says, where are you going, brother? He said, I'm going home and cutting my grass. He said, why didn't you cut it before you come to church? He said, didn't need it then. <laughs> but I want to put you at ease. I have six generations of people buried at Concord Primitive Baptist Church over in uh, Randolph County. Uh, but I won't put you at ease. A few years ago uh, at Miller Valley High School where I graduated in 1953 and 1967, I was called upon to speak to the graduating class uh, that year. And so if you know anything about these little country schools, they would fill the place up, just standing room only. And I was scared to death. And so I went to my old uh, school teacher. Oh, she was a, a good one. And my wife said she was smart. Said she, and she, she never married. But uh, that said a lot to me. But anyhow, uh, I told my situation. We were sitting out on the front porch, looking out across the fields. The wind was blowing those uh, 
sage grass about out there. And, and uh, I told her my situation. She says, Zenas, I can help you. Well, that just lifted a load for my shoulder. I says, you tell me what to do, Mr. Ferguson, and I'll do it. She says, you get you a good subject. I've got a good subject right here. And says, you have a good beginning and a good ending and have them close together. And I've never forgotten that. Uh, so I'll, I won't hold you too long, but I do want to, I could stand here all afternoon and tell you about uh, Les and Francis coming to see us and the good times we've had together and uh, just many, many times, wasn't it, Francis? Just a lot of great times. And uh, uh, I'll just tell you a few answers. Now, let me tell you, they arrived. Les wanted to get there by dinner because my sweet wife sitting over here. She, she's one of the greatest cooks in the United States of America. I don't care where you go. You won't find any, any better cook than she is. And they'd get there, and let me tell you, you wouldn't find a better eater than Les Beasley either. Now, he had little, but he could put the groceries away. And you know, we'd, uh, we'd eat, and after we eat, uh, we walked in our den there, and uh, I had a recliner that Margaret bought me to uh, lay back and rest in. Well, Les hit that first thing after dinner. And of course, I'm six foot three and Les about five, eight or something like that. And he got in my chair and his feet about six inches off the ground uh, floor. But that didn't matter because he lay back and went to sleep. And I thought, well, Les, that is, I understand why. And I looked over there and Francis sleep too. Yeah, uh, but uh, anyhow, uh, we, we, they woke up in less and I, I said, left. if we're going to have some fish while y'all here, we got to go fishing. So uh, I am a commercial fisherman also, and I don't know when y'all familiar with this stuff or not, but I buy uh, cheese, old rank cheese, in a 55-gallon drum. And folks, I'll tell you, you can... You could smell it. I mean, it's the stinkiest stuff you ever smell. And in fact, when I'd go down, go through town with my old boat, with that cheese on it, they said, some of them wouldn't even have, they'd have their back to the street. And they said, well, I goes the preacher. So they could smell that cheese. Well, we got down there and I had a basket, a box tied, wooden box tied to a dead tree out in the water. And I was trying to get it up. Well, I fell overboard. I got hung over my feet still in the boat. Well, Les gets me by the heels, trying to pull me back in, and gets that cheese all over him, you know. And finally, I just, he had said, he said, you think you got to fall in? I can't get you. So I had to fall in, swim to the bank, and uh, uh, he paddled the boat over there and got me. And we know how we got home, and we walked in. We, in fact, we dressed our fish. And washed out. I got a little uh, Home Depot barn out there that I got a uh, kitchen downstairs and bed and bath and everything up upstairs. I call it my own private dog dog house. And Clark, I want you and all these other fellas, uh, Randy and all y'all, to know that it's for rent. If you, uh -huh. and I've had a few people to rent it too. I won't tell you that, but. Uh, Anyhow, uh, we washed up our hands with Clorox and everything we got, had. When we walked in, Francis said, Zenith, you and Les sure do stink. Well, we had on those old clothes, you know. Well, we had to take off our clothes and, and put on clean clothes and go on. But uh, the next day, uh, it was in the summertime, and it, it was just the right time for our corn to be ready where we could... Uh, uh, have cream corn and uh, Francis says Zenith I, I'd love to have a couple of dozen ears of that corn to carry back to Florida with me I said well you can sure have it so after dental uh, Les and I tore out to the corn patch wasn't far away down by a little stream of water and uh, we pulled up and isn't it a Lincoln what you drive Francis is that what is it Mercury or Lincoln it's a big old car anyhow and uh, Les opened that trunk, who you seen it? And uh, we had two five-gallon buckets, and we went and got two five-gallon buckets of corn poured in the trunk of it. 
And I says, Les, let me tell you something, another. What of this corn you don't get, the deer going to eat it? He said, well, let's, let's get a little more. And so I would fill up a five-gallon bucket, and while he was going to the truck, I'd, to the trunk of the car, I'd fill up another. Well, we filled that trunk as much corn as would go in it. It just packed it in there. Got back home, and uh, Francis, uh, Les told Francis, said, we got to go. We got a bunch of corn to take care of when we get home. Well, let me tell you, dear people, I wish you could see that big old car. Left, they left out. Uh, it looked like two bootleggers leaving out. <laughs> that thing is nearly dragging the ground. Well, they got home about sundown and started shucking corn. And when they got it shucked, uh, Francis says, Les, if you'll silk it, I'll cut it off. Well, uh, they started cutting off and silking corn. Now, I'm telling you, folks, I'm, Francis, am I telling the truth? That's exactly the way it was. They got home with that. And at 2.30 the next morning, Francis says, Les, says, how much more have we got? <laughs> he, he says, we got four more ears. She said, I, I don't think I can cut it off. <laughs> Mark and I went down to see them later and opened the refrigerator and corn and, and uh, uh, turnip greens fell out on the floor. Uh, but we had a lot of great time, didn't we? A wonderful time. And Les will go down as one of the greatest men I have ever known. President of the uh, Quartet Convention and uh, owner of the Florida Boys, lead singer for them for years. I promoted them a lot of time. Enjoyed them uh, so much. And uh, I look forward to seeing Les up there with the angels singing in that great choir. Uh, may God richly bless all of your family. I could, as I said, I could talk a little bit and tell you about Les and the great times we had together. But, uh, I'm going to close and uh, say to, uh, to uh, Dale and uh, all of you that have, uh, that have seen us that's here today, I, I love you. I've promoted all of you down through the years. And I was called upon uh, Saturdays a week ago to say, sing uh, this old house uh, that uh, at... Uh, E. Paul Jones, he's judge in Alexander City. I sung it to his mother's funeral. And they, the children asked me to sing it. But I asked Paul, probably been 25, 30 years ago, I sung it to his mother's funeral. And I says, Paul, why do you want me to sing? I was doing the eulogy. I said, why do you want me to sing this old house? He says, well, his mother was worn out. And says, if you're singing... <clears throat> Don't get her up. She'll have to wait till Resurrection Day. So uh, that's a good reason for me not to sing today, but I appreciate y'all's good singing, all of you. And then I'll say this in closing. I did one Wednesday. Fellow Charles Nolan in Wadley, Alabama, and when I read his survivors, let me tell you, he had 64 survivors, 30 Two great grandkids, twenty great grand, twenty grandkids, thirty-two great grandkids, three great great grandkids, and uh, sons and daughters. It all totaled up to sixty-four. I told the family, I don't blame him for dying, just for Christmas, because to buy all those presents to break it up with. Thank you and God bless you. Thank y'all. Jesus said, I go away to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I will return so that you, so that you may
It is a, a distinct honor and privilege for us to be able to be here, uh, not only just be here, to, but to be involved in today's homegoing celebration. I've, I've had the privilege of knowing Les Beasley for 50 years, and uh, in those 50 years, a lot of things have transpired uh, involving myself and, and Les, and a lot of the stories that uh, these guys have been telling uh, I was around in some of those situations uh, at a distance, but I knew about them. And there's a certain brotherhood that is attached uh, to Les, and uh, it's called the Quartet Man Brotherhood. And the, the folks who are quartet people, you know exactly what I'm talking about. There's just a kinship there, and there always has been. Um, I, as soon as I found out that Les had stepped through the pearly gates, one of the very first things, Clark, that I thought about was the first time I remember seeing your dad in his undershorts. <laughs> My brother Jerry uh, had, had uh, accepted the position with the Florida Boys to sing tenor for them, and they allowed me to travel with them one weekend when I was between groups. And uh, I had never seen a man in boxer shorts before that day. And Les wore boxer shorts, in case you need to write that down for historical fact. But when I walked into the Holiday Inn that day in Oklahoma City, I stood there with my mouth dropped, my jaw dropped. And I know that that's just the way I looked. And Les was standing in the mirror with his wife beater t-shirt and his boxer shorts shaving his face. And he looks, and Jerry and I are coming through the door. And I look up, and I see him standing there, and I'm just in shock. And he turned around and looked at me and said, what's wrong, boy? I said, I've never seen anyone wearing boxer shorts. He looked at Jerry. He said, well, you better get him out of here before Daryl gets in here. <laughs> Uh, first thing I thought of, I don't know why. But uh, the other thing I thought of was the fact that this uh, gospel music world that we've lived in, so a myriad of memories and thoughts, and the first time I was ever on television was directly because of that man. And he said, uh, I want you to play bass today on uh, the Jubilee taping scared me out of my mind. I didn't know G from A flat, and, I, and still don't. 
uh, and some of y'all already know that, so you don't have to say anything. But I, I was in, uh, literally in shock because uh, Les Beasley thought enough of a teenage boy to try to encourage him and help him along the way. And that's one of the reasons I'm standing here today is because of the unselfishness of a man that became my friend. And he truly was a soldier. He served in our nation's military. But he was also a soldier in the army of the Lord. In fact, one of the generals in that army when it comes to our world of gospel music. And he will be missed. But just a few days ago, he left this place for a far better place. And we that remain rejoice in the reality and the hope that we will one day get to be with him because the king will return to get us all. Amen. That's right. Yeah. 
Thank you, Mark. Glory be unto the Lord. Miss Francis, thank you for uh, putting together this service, you and your family, and uh, letting us rejoice with you for these moments this morning. In just a few minutes, we'll make our way from this place. We'll go out this aisle and uh, we'll head to the cemetery. If you're parked out there, you can come around here and you can go with us. In a moment, we're going to prepare to do that. Gerald's going to come back and lead us as we lift our voices. And I'm going to call an audible and do something a little different. How many of you singers are in this place that less touched you and you were in gospel music? Yeah. I'm going to ask you as soon as I get done, I want you to come join Gerald right here and sing that song with him at the end while the family then goes out. Clark, I get permission to do that. Amen. Thank you, sir. Hear the word of the Lord today in the Psalms for just a moment. Three or four years ago, Les came to me and said, Pastor, would you like to have the Gaithers come? I said, well... Yeah, I think I would. And so we did, and backstage I, I made a photo before they, uh, were, they were practicing, and, and I made that, and I showed uh, Brother Les this picture. And I said to him, I said, now here's a real singer with two guys who think they can And he gave me that old stink eye look like he could do, you know. And he looked at me like, I said, the guy in the middle is the real singer. And these two guys who think they can over here on each side. Like so many of you, I love to laugh with Brother Les. And he and Miss Francis had come in these last five, six years, really, when I've known him best. They'd come in this way. And every Sunday, we'd have a chuckle of some kind. And it was good. He'd have a good word for the pastor, and I would try to have a good word for him. Hear the word of the Lord. Psalm 43, David said, Judge me, O God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation. O deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man. For thou art the God of my strength. Why dost thou cast me off? Why am I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? O send out thy light and thy truth. Let them, the light and truth, lead me. Let them bring me unto the holy hill and to the tabernacles. Then will I go unto the altar of God. Unto unto God my exceeding joy. Yea, upon the harp will I praise thee, O God my God. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, who is the health of my countenance in my God. Verse 4 said, I will go to the altar of God. When I got word we were going to do this service, I went to the computer. I grew up here in that gospel jubilee on Sunday morning. As a matter of fact, last Sunday as I was gone, I was with my mother on Monday. I showed her Les's picture, and I said, do you know who? She said, that's Les Beasley. Lives on the mountain up in North Alabama. She said, I saw him on television yesterday morning, Sunday, before I went to church. Said they were playing that river. I said, well, I'm going to do his. She said, you're going to do his? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, my goodness. How that music's touched me all these years. Every Sunday morning, getting me ready to go to church. Well, I began to Google and look online, and I found out a lot of things about my good friend. 
out of the Marine Corps, the reason that flag is there serving in Korea, then coming and with that first group and then with the Florida boys and being with Mr. Gaither, developing the Dove Award and fashioning the statue that is the Dove Award, saying it should be curved so that the Dove is looking over on the recipient as if we need the blessing of the Holy Ghost. That was who he was, a mind of gospel and fun and entertainment, lifting the soul. Oh, my soul, why are you so cast down? Run to the altar. And then I found an old video of a song that the credit where I read it said that Les Beasley wrote it. Now, you can't believe everything you find on the computer. I don't know for sure he did, but they credited Les Beasley is the writer of Lead Me to the Altar on this particular place. Lead me to the altar, lead me. I hear Jesus, my Savior, calling me. His tender voice I hear. I feel his presence near. Lead me to the altar. Lead me. And then Les told the story. They were humming in the background. And he said, I was sitting in the pew. And there was an old man next to me. You know, Les's daddy was a pastor. One of the gentlemen told me yesterday, he said, Les used to say, my daddy was one of the most popular preachers in the world. Seemed like every year and a half or two years, somebody else wanted him to come pastor their church. Said we moved a lot in those days. He told the story of sitting in the pew, and he said, as the pastor pressed the gospel, the old man looked over at me and took my hand and said, I've been... In this country church, I'm blind and old and feeble. I've lived in vain, and my life is sin-stained. He said, the old man took his hand and said, lead me to the altar. Lead me. And down the aisle came that man with that old man in that song. Lead me to the altar. Well, dear friend, I want to encourage you today that you let this man's death lead you to the altar. It ought to lead you to the altar of conversion. If you're in this room today, you love gospel music. But let me tell you, you can love gospel music miss the gospel. You can come to church and miss heaven. Not everybody that comes here is going there. The Bible says you must be born again. You must run to the altar and fall before God and say, Lord, be merciful to me, a, savior, a sinner, and save my soul. It's the altar of conversion. I found it as a little 10-year-old boy. My daddy found it as a 23-year-old adult man, and my granddaddy found it as a 65-year-old man. When he was on the cross, I was on his back. One of the videos I listened to, Les said this was a Florida Boys theme song, that they'd do it every time. When he was on the cross, you were on his mind. Jesus died for you. Dear friend, you must believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. Call on him. It's the altar of conversion. But not only is it the altar of conversion, it's the altar of comfort. Miss Francis, 50 years married to Brother Les. My goodness. I, I did not know your story until we talked how you had those five children. And Les, in his 40th year, when you married, and for every one of your kids, and then for Clark as he came to say, my Lord, what a man. 
Well, God blessed him, in no, but the blessing was not as heavy 50 years ago. Starting and working, and taking care of a 16 and a 14, a 12 and a 10 and 8-year-old, and a beautiful wife, and being on the road. My goodness. Clark said it well. This is not a day of sadness, really. We rejoice, but let me tell you, when you close the lid and the tear wells in your eye and you, it grows up in your throat because you know he's present with the Lord, but you'll not see him again. And you won't hear that funny voice that we heard about. You won't hear that joke. You won't have that firm hand that every one of these girls said. <laughs> Boy, was he a firm hand at our house. A couple of the girls said he ran boys off, blessed them richly. <laughs> Amen. He won't be there. I'm, I'm telling you, we need the comforter. Where do we find the comforter? We find the comforter at the altar of God. You come and you say, oh God, be the parakletos in my life. Be the one who stands alongside of me. Miss Francis, I'm here to tell you this book says, I don't understand everything in here. I'm just the messenger, not the writer. But God says to the orphan child and to the widow, there is a special dispensation of God's grace. I know these girls and sons will be around you, but they'll be... There'll be times when you're just by yourself. But God will never leave you. Run to the altar. And gentlemen, uh, my son, he says bye to his daddy. That's a hard day. It's a hard day. But you've got a father that sticks closer than a brother. Find you an altar and cry out. And to you girls, you women, these that he raised his daughters, run to the altar and let the Spirit of God be your comforter. It's the altar of conversion. It's the altar of comfort. But now listen to this preacher. It's an altar of confession. Some of you know the Lord, but you're a long way from him. See, Les Beasley didn't just write this song, Lead Me to the Altar. He lived this song. In January of 2015, I stood right here like I do nearly every Sunday and offered a gospel invitation. I have pretty good peripheral vision. Every preacher has to have it. You get in a building this size, you got to see where they're coming from. And on that particular day in January, I noticed a stirring back here where Les and Francis sit. And I thought, well, that's odd. And Les Beasley stepped out in the aisle. I said, well, it's not like him to leave early. But he didn't go out. Brother Jerry came down this aisle right here. I met him right, right here. I thought, well, he's got a grandchild or a great-grandchild sick or he's ill or he wants me to pray for him. I took him by the hand. I said, Brother Les, why have you come? That's what I ask everybody. If you come Sunday and I preach, you come down here, I'm going to shake you. I'm going to ask you, why have you come? I led an old Texan to the Lord when I was in Texas one time and told him to come make his profession. I took him by. I said, why have you come? He said, well, you told me to, preacher. That's why I'm here. Well, I hadn't said a word to Brother Les. I said, why have you come? In his 85th year, he said, preacher, I got some things in my life I got to deal with, and I need to be baptized the Bible way after my confession. I didn't talk a lot about it, but he had been saved somewhere along the way, but he sensed there was a need for water baptism after his trusting of Christ. 
And on the 11th day of January, right below that stained glass, we baptized Les Beasley, and he's 85 years old. I had people, it's just this whole place was buzzing. They said, you know who that was? I said, y'all know who that was? That guy, he sung all over the world. Y'all know who that was? I said, yeah, I know who it is. He's a sinner saved by grace. He comes like everybody else comes. Amen. That's how you'll come if you come. You won't come because you got your name on the side of a bus. You'll come to the altar of confession because you need the blessed Lord to save you. He had been saved. He just needed to get things in order. I have no doubt I'm talking to some people here today that need to get some things in order. Some of you have never been to the altar of conversion. Get saved today. Some of you need comfort like this family. And others need confession of just saying, Lord, forgive me. Let's get things squared. Now let me let you know a little secret. When you stand on this stage or any stage, and when the bright lights come on, it's easy to think you're somebody that you're really not. Nothing is more addictive than man's applause. And you must constantly die to yourself when you are in the limelight so that you can live unto Christ. I believe this gentleman was the real deal. He knew the bright light. But he knew what it was to kneel at the altar and say, Oh God, I need to get things in order. I want to say one last word to my favorite people at every funeral. Grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Now I want to say something to you. Go to your grandmother and tell her the preacher said you could and ask for something. I don't know, a pair of cufflinks, tie, maybe a pen. It doesn't have to be something worth it. Just get you a memento of Les Beasley. Put it somewhere that you see it so that you remember granddaddy and great-grandfather and say the Jesus that he used to sing about. I want to follow with all of my heart. Miss Francis will help you find something. Just a trinket or something small. It doesn't have to be big. But just something you can see. And let me tell you. Run to that altar. Run, grandchildren. Run to the altar. Let your granddaddy lead you to the altar. Make sure you got things in order. All you singers that lifted your hand, I want you to come on right now. Just get up right quick. Brother Gerald, I want you to have a, have a choir. Let's sing. Let's let the choir sing. They're going to lead us. We, we're going to sing a glorious old song. Yeah, I've met more singers in here. I've been in meetings with some of these folks. Amen. Yeah. So you can just gather around one mic or two or three just... Make it up, Gerald. You know how to do it. Sure. Amen. Thank you, gentlemen, ladies, Thanks. for coming. I met so many of you on the way in. I thought, well, I'll just let everybody sing one time. That's good. I almost joined them on The King is Coming. I, I heard that the second Sunday in December, 1970, or January, December, 1972, in the Dallas Convention Center. First time I ever heard that song. Man, I, that's a glorious, glorious song. The King is Coming. Why don't y'all just kind of wad in here close to Gerald, all right? Yeah. I love to tell singers what to do. Y'all just kind of <laughs> come on in there. That'll be good. They're going to sing. And then on the last, we'll have the family, and we'll, we'll go out, and you can greet them and then follow us over to the 
burial site if you want to drive around and be a part make sure you turn on your flashers you need to do that as we get out and we've got a few minutes here till they're ready for us so let's just all stand together as we rise brother Gerald let's sing this glorious old song amen and this bunch will help us to do it right here glory land it's not far away here we go <laughs> 